Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest in our series of uh, webcasts this year. We're, we're delighted to uh, be hosting this session, which is uh, Global Business Services, Shared Services, State of the Industry 2023, highly relevant. And um, so thank you for joining us. Um, you will have seen on the introduction and on this logo here, there's a sort of um, metamorphosis going on and a butterfly um, metaphor. And it was interesting just to uh, just this week, we're having uh, we're just walking out of the office to lunch, and our our colleague uh, Pete Warren managed to catch the aforesaid butterfly. So it just shows how popular this webcast is uh, getting. Um, so uh, I'm Dan French. I'm the guy on the left. I'm a CEO at Consider Solutions. I'm delighted to welcome Tom Bangerman. Welcome, Tom. Hello. Hello. And uh, Tom, you can see, is both uh, head of data development and research at SSON Research and Analytics, but he also is the man that is single-handedly, you know, damaging all the statistics of employ employment and wins the prize for someone with the most jobs at one time. Um, so it's astonishing that he's a uh, managing director of two organizations. He's an analyst, advisor, consultant. He's also a creative artist under the uh, pseudonym of the Digital Natives, which you might hear more of later. So um, we're delighted to have Tom with us. Uh, this is the only time outside of the uh, Shared Services and Outsourcing Week conferences you'll hear this uh, material, so we're really pleased for Tom to share that with us. So um, that's a little picture of me and Tom. I think I was in Lisbon last year, but I could be, uh, could be wrong. Uh, I'll make a few uh, introductions, and then I'm going to hand over to Tom to talk, uh, talk us through the research and there's some fascinating data points coming out of this. And I want to come back at the end and work out what can we take away from that? You know, what can we what can we really learn? Now, as we go through, ask any questions. There's going to be lots of questions coming to mind. Pop them into the interface on your go to webinar screen. Just pop the questions in. We'll answer some at the end of this. We won't have time to answer them all, but we will respond by email. Um, we're going to do this in 30, perhaps 35 minutes, but that is our kind of our limit. So we're going to be pretty you know, pushing through this. If you have any technical problems, again, go into the Q&A uh, session and um, in, in, enter a question and one of our team will try to help you. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So um, moving straight on, um, there are two important publications. One, one on the left we're talking about today, but Tom is also the author of the very, very first book on shared services. And I happen to have a signed copy in my office, but uh, if you haven't got it, Get it uh, because uh, someone's got to pay for Tom's retirement. But um, it's a it is a really uh, interesting session, and uh, so we're going to be talking about that. And just before I hand over to Tom, we're at the Orlando uh, SSOW conference, and the uh, keynote speaker was Alex Rodriguez, the, the famous um, baseball star, American baseball star. Those of you who follow baseball will know all about him. But uh, Tom was watching this rather quizzically and said to me, well, if he's A-Rod, which he is known by that an A-Rod, why can't I be T-Bang? So with that, I'd like to welcome T-Bang to uh, tell us a shared services state of the industry. Over to you, Tom. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dan. All right, so now from all the joking, more to serious stuff. Um, this, is the, this is the model that we use in SSON. I'm obviously not gonna spend time on explaining models here, don't worry about it. We cover the different dimensions and do different pieces of research. And what I've done basically for this presentation, I've gone through all the different dimensions and different research pieces and sort of put together a best of, if you want uh, to exhibit the main topics today. So there's very little on each topic just to highlight the sort of key points that I, I think are most interesting for us. In terms of shared services and GBS, um, regardless of whatever you, are called or what you identify with, there are approximately two thirds of companies that are multifunction, multi-regional GBS, and they often also use that terminology. But there are, are also companies or organizations that are functional shared services, so either just finance and accounting or HR or something else. Uh, in any case, this presentation is relevant for everybody and we just carry both abbreviations here just to make sure that um, that people understand that you don't have to be a huge global GBS for this to be relevant to you. One question I ask in basically every single uh, research piece that I run with SSON is, what is your maturity level? Um, it's interesting, there would be a whole book about what maturity level is and is not and what people understand it to be. But what is interesting is that after 30 plus years of 
running shared service and DBS organizations, we're now at the point where 29% think they are high or expert. So either most people are not moving very fast, uh, or there has been quite a lot of people who have started this just recently because most of them still identify as being medium. And then we can ask the same question on the automation topic. We can, of course, measure automation in many different ways. How many activities are automated, how, how many percent of the process is automated, and all kinds of stuff like that. But what is a good indication typically is just to ask people about their own perception in terms of how well automated their organization is. It's, it's mostly quite accurate and funny enough, people are quite honest. Um, and not that it's funny, but it's good. And if you look at it, 14 plus 4% 4 are high and experts. So it's only 18% in total. So even less than the maturity level. Uh, if you think about the fact that shared services is really all about automating all the activities that we don't want to spend time and money on doing, 14% plus 4% being expert, 18% now being in that category is not a very good result in my view after 30 plus years. So we could also constitute that it just takes longer than we typically estimate. Then if you look at top strategic priorities that people have, and this is quite typical for uh, timing where we're asking this question in a situation where there's a lot of crisis ongoing, because whenever there's a lot of crises, cost always moves to the top of the list. Um, it's probably based on uh, insecurity or risk mitigation. Um, people might not even be in a recession yet, but they're estimating one to come at some point in time. So they start with cost measures already. Whether the recession ever comes or not, doesn't really matter. You still run through these cost activities. So you could argue it's a, it's a it's a valid approach because you do need to prepare for something that could be coming. Um, nevertheless, a lot of us have been in GBS for a long time and we tend to talk about things like value all the time. And it's astonishing that it's still at only 36%. And if you remember that GBS model I showed you in the beginning that we're using, and you might be using a different one, but in most of these value is at the core of the model, whether it explicitly says so or not. And then, of course, it, all of this is about customers. And customer is in the middle here, 34%, also quite low. And if you're running any type of service business, you can't be successful and it cannot be sustainable if your customers in the long run are not happy with what you're doing. So I think there's still a potential to improve the, the a view on customer centricity and customer intimacy. Agility is something that we have been talking about in the last couple of years a lot. We saw that the crisis was an interesting test. I mean, the COVID crisis was an interesting test. There's so many, I need to quote which one, was an interesting test on agility. Uh, and most GBS uh, were actually getting through COVID quite well. And it's funny, but it shows that companies like stable risk-free operations but that stability is actually achieved through agility. So you need to be agile to produce stability um, because that's how, that's how you can respond to changing internal external requirements. And compliance is very low on this list, um, maybe because it's not really sexy or interesting to, to focus on, but remember that compliance is sort of a must have or prerequisite for running any sort of shared service or GBS operation. If you're not compliant and your finance activities, especially are not compliant, you can just close down the whole operation. So the list makes sense. Uh, the waiting is, um, is something that um, was not exactly as I expected it to be. And then this slide, obviously you can't read anything. And while you're searching for the second pair of glasses, let me tell you that it's not about reading all the details. I just want to exhibit that one, the scope of activities that is covered by different shared services and GBS organizations today is actually quite impressive. I mean, not long ago, we started with a few transactional processes in finance, maybe HR, and now the list gets longer and longer. On the top, you'll still see the transactional finance and HR processes that are done in most organizations. 
If you see, for example, purchase to pay or procure to pay at 69%, and you remember that there are organizations that don't have finance in scope, that actually means that almost everybody who does have finance in scope does something on this transactional process. So the coverage is pretty good on, on transactional processes. But there's a lot of other things also. In the middle of this slide, you see a lot of procurement and supply chain activity, which is the area that is increasing fastest. So this, the coverage of those activities is growing uh, in most organizations quite fast currently. And there are things on the bottom of this list, which I keep telling people, you should not ignore things which are on the lower half of a slide just because they're on the lower half of the slide, because they might still be relevant to you. For example, if you look at health and safety at 6%, you might be in an industry that doesn't deal with that topic. But if you're in oil and gas, chemicals, things like that, that might be a huge topic for you. And most of those companies actually do have exactly this process in scope of GBS because it's a, it's a big area to cover. So these processes on the bottom half also can be very relevant depending on what kind of sector or business you're in. And then there's something like marketing more or less in the middle at 12%, which is, I would argue, most likely relevant to almost everybody. And it's not marketing of your center. It's not branding and marketing of your center itself. It is the marketing activities on, of your company that GBS could support with or do to a certain extent. I think that's one of the biggest potentials currently. I've run several webinars and workshops on this topic, and it seems to be growing quite fast. Then in terms of number of locations, I ran a specific location-related study. The idea was not to tell you which country or city is the nicest, but just to look at sort of the location logic that companies have um, in general. And if you look at the number of locations, so from one to six, that's about three quarters of companies. And that's based on the old follow the sun principle that you have one center for the Americas, one center for Europe, Africa, one center in Asia. And then you add centers, China for China, Russia for Russia, and centers for specific reasons, historical, political, scope-based, or whatever it is, and you end up as a global organization in somewhere around you know, five to six locations, typically. So it's a fairly standard model. What is interesting in coming out of this study is that the number of organization, uh, locations was actually decreasing for a very long time, and the trend uh, seems to have uh, been reversed. So there's currently an increase in locations, and it relates to um, a few things, but mostly it re relates to the insecurity we experience currently. So because of all the crises, people are validating whether they're in the right locations. They might be moving activities, although it's very few. And they're also thinking of difficulties on the talent side to actually recruit people. So they might be better off if they can tap into more labor markets. And also, maybe it's not so wise to put all the eggs in one basket and too much risk into one place because you never know what happens, even if it's a, it's a stable place currently. So therefore, people are in general distributing the activity across more locations. And it's also because techno technologically, this is possible today because the scalability is very good in most tools um, and, you can, uh, and you can run organizations with several centers easier than maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And there was a lot of very interesting slides in this location study. I'll just show you two. One is on cost. Um, and this is not the cost comparison in terms of actual cost, because you will have seen plenty of those. But this is the perception of people. So if you ask people which regions in the world do you think are the most competitive in terms of cost, not surprisingly, you get India on top of the list. Maybe somewhat surprisingly, you get LATAM or Latin America in second place. Then obviously you get the, the three on the right uh, in, 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 in the last uh, position because they are not really uh, delivery locations, North America, Western Europe and, and Australia and New Zealand. Um, so obviously they are higher cost locations. And then of course, this is a bit unfair to some countries because if you're Looking at, for example, Middle East and Africa, it's a huge region. That would be about 80 countries or so. Uh, and of course, there are huge differences. So just in terms of um, 
Middle East and North Africa, you would have, for example, Egypt, which cost level is close to India. It's about India plus 10 or plus 20 percent, depending on scope. And then you have places like Dubai, which are more Western cost levels. So, of course, this is a bit of a simplification here. But then we took that slide and all the other uh, dimensions that we asked for. You can see here on the top cost, workforce availability, availability of digital skills and so on. And all the regions on the left and map them together in one overview. And you can see the dark colors indicate that these countries or regions are perceived to be very good at these things. And the white space means exactly what white space means that it's a problem because there's no coverage or it's bad. So Western Europe in terms of cost, for example, obviously is fairly white. And you can see on the top, if you look at India, you go from left to right, that India is really good at everything or perceived to be good at everything except for customer centricity. So Indians might protest and say that's not the case, but then that's a good thing if they have the capability, then they just need to make sure that marketing, branding, positioning and messaging wise, that message actually is received because currently most customers think that they're not good at that. So this might not be so uh, relevant to people who are doing a location study, but it might be relevant, for example, for a location uh, agency who's trying to sell, for example, Latin America and looks at agility and innovation being a fairly wide space there. Um, obviously, that would need to improve if you want to get more business in the near future. And then in terms of center size, most centers uh, tend to be somewhere around 1,000 FTEs plus minus, although that's just an average. In reality, the distribution is huge. There's many small ones and there's a few very, very large ones. But as I indicated, most companies are currently not so interested in growing them to be uh, of unlimited size because they like to control uh, risk and, uh, and mitigate all kinds of possible issues coming up. Then I ran uh, another study on the topic of outsourcing. And of course, it was about outsourcing itself, but also the comparison captive versus outsourcing. And one of the most interesting questions was which of the two models, captive or outsource, has delivered more benefit to you? Very simple question. Of course, very simplified also, but you get as a result 80 20 in terms of captive being on the top. It's not surprising. We know that a lot of organizations prefer captive models. Nevertheless, when you, uh, when you continue with this topic and you ask about the future, you get an interesting answer. Because if we look at, for example, the move from the blue to the yellow, so the blue is what is your sourcing model today, and the yellow is what is your target sourcing model in two to three years, you see that in the picture, there's sort of a move from left to right. The blue bars get a bit smaller to the right and the yellow bars increase a little bit. So it moves a little bit from fully captive to more selective outsourcing or hybrid models. And I'm just showing you one slide on this, but the summary is that actually both outsourcing as well as offshoring is expected to increase. And I'll, I'll try to explain why this is the case, because it's kind of funny, isn't it? I, I called this in the report I wrote, the outsourcing conundrum, because if everybody's so happy with the past and the captive model, why would they then plan to outsource more? But this slide tries to explain it in uh, in a very simple way. So if you ask about the benefits that outsourcing gives, and there's even a distribution here by size of organizations, so you can see big, medium, and small companies. And on the top left, you can see need to transform business. And in this transformation area, this is the famous transformation journey that most of us are on especially large companies, the orange bar, they say it is very helpful to have a partner because maybe historical, political, other reasons are very, very difficult to overcome to really transform businesses. So sometimes it might be easier to give activity to an outside party. And the, the medium and smaller companies basically agree with this point. And then it could also be other things like top right, talent, skills driven. And that is especially an issue to smaller companies. So they might not be able to find all the talent because they don't have the reach that large companies have. They can't tap into every single labor market on the planet and source wherever you want. So that's why a partner that is, uh, is uh, active in those markets might be helpful. 
And it could also be other things on the left, for example, investment required. So the partner could provide models where if you don't have the funding, and again, that's especially for small companies, a relevant point, they can, they can still get, for example, technology uh, that they otherwise could not get their hands on. So these are some of the reasons why we think that although captive was good in the past and is still going to stay the base, there might be more outsourcing in the future and it might be selective, but there's still going to be uh, more thinking in that direction. And then I did, uh, or I never do these things alone, of course, but we did an HR study just on the HR function and HR GBS activity. And one of the most interesting findings was about um, what the greatest challenge is in developing effective HR services operations. And often we tend to think, or many people who are not in HR talk badly about HR and say, look, HR just doesn't want to implement the shared services model. They don't like it. So they just want to stick to their old behaviors. In reality, at least this is what the study suggests, the biggest resistance is from senior leaders and managers who you know, just like to have their HR guy locally next to them and ask them questions and talk to them. So it's not necessarily the HR people themselves who are against this model. And now after I've given HR plus point, I also need to give HR minus point, which is on the topic of self-services. So if you've been in shared service GBS as long as me, so very long since the last century, then you will know that self-service is not a new topic. I mean, this was something that was always discussed in context of every process uh, design and process optimization. Uh, instead of optimizing something, the question was always, can we leave it out? Can we eliminate it? Or can we at least move it into some sort of self-service solution? So it's been around 30 years almost. And if you now look at the top right of this, um, this um, overview here, then only 13% of all HR shared service activity actually has a high self-service adoption level. So since this is a very cost, uh, cost efficient and, um, and quite proven solution in general, of course, there's lots of different detailed solutions, but in general, it's quite surprising we're only at 13%. So in positive ways, there's a big opportunity there. And then on the topic of process ownership or global process ownership. I mean, we all try to do what we call end-to-end -end process optimization. And we know that one of the best levers to do this, if there is a end-to-end -end process view in your organization, somebody who takes uh, an end-to-end -end view or some end-to-end -end understanding of what is going on from where the process starts to the recipient or the outcome, whatever that is, because then the optimization of that process is much easier. So GPOs or process owners, whether they're global, never mind, they're just often called GPOs, is, is used quite often, but not very successfully. And the scope of using it is often limited to a handful of processes. Typically transactional finance, so order to cash, purchase to pay, record to report, and maybe payroll. But why would you limit it to those? And that's why the purpose of this overview really is to show you that increasingly a lot of companies are utilizing the gpo concept and nominating gpos for many many other processes so if you think about the slide with all the processes i showed you in the beginning why would you not take that full scope and try to to nominate gpos for all of those activities in terms of um skills that people are looking for in the market um we have a very difficult labor market in basically every country in the world. So it's interesting to see what the, what the skills are that people are looking for most. Um, in the middle, you will see something which is good, which is that the search for automation skills is dropped from 58 to 39%, which means two things. One, it's still something that is very much sought after. Um, but it's not as critical anymore because the supply seems to be increasing. Now that everybody was focusing on technology skills, the supply has increased somewhat. So it's still a problem, but not as big as it used to be. Biggest topic on top of the list is process design continuous improvement, but then you'll find a lot of things on the list that are, let's say, analytical or behavioral 
uh, topics like problem solving, customer experience, leadership, stakeholder engagement, change management, and so on. And many of these things you can teach people. I think basically you can teach them everything on this list except for one, and that's empathy. So if you really need empathy, and I would be surprised if you don't need that in your organization, then that would be the one thing I would put on the list to make sure it's recruited because I can't fix that later. In terms of what the people are actually looking for, most of the talent that we recruit today and most of the young folks, and remember that's most of the people in the shared service organizations because the average age is quite young, are not necessarily motivated by compensation only. It's only in fifth place in the middle of this slide at 44%. But what they look for much more is things like revisiting the employee value proposition at 66% or below that at 47%, selling the purpose-led vision of the company culture. And while those things always sound nice, the trick is to actually make it work in the sense that you explain how the transactional or sim simple activities that they perform in a shared service center relate to that company purpose, which, for example, when I gave away the, um, the world's best GBS award and the uh, runner up was Takeda, which is a medical uh, or pharmaceutical company, they were able to do a fantastic job on this, explaining an individual employee in the service center, how that activity related to the medication that somebody received somewhere in the world and helped save lives. And that to young people is exactly the purpose based connection they want to see in the activities they're doing. And then even a simple activity can actually be somehow value adding in their eyes. A topic that I also did a study on, which obviously I've done a few uh, lately, but um, I thought this was also a good uh, a topic to um, look into was branding. And what I mean by that is branding the GBS organization itself and whether you brand it under the company um, brand and logo and visual identifiers or whether you do something specific. And that is a question that you need to decide for yourselves. But what was interesting is that only half the companies um, actually do anything in branding, the other half doesn't. But most of those, 42%, have now discovered that maybe it is something that they should look into because it might help both in selling to their stakeholders, uh, repositioning within the company and also in the external labor market to attract talent uh, in a better way. So a topic to, to look into. And if you are then successful in recruiting all these people, they will nevertheless leave you in one to three years, which is the bad news, um, because they will, <laughs> whatever you do. So therefore, the, the, the next topic that you need to cover is to have a very good recruiting, training, staffing uh, activity, which is as standardized and as efficient as possible because you will have probably higher fluctuation than you would like to. Another topic that's upcoming, and that's why SSON is currently running a study on this topic, is ESG. You might know that in Europe, for example, uh, you have to report on ESG activity starting 2024. So every one of the companies who operates in any EU country has to do this. I think that's a really good activity for GBS to take on. I'm not sure anybody else would want to produce that report, but, um, but that, is, um, that is something that you should look into. And then uh, basically last topic I wanna mention here is how many GBS are participating in the enterprise's digital agenda? And you could ask, why is it relevant for us to participate in, in any sort of digital agenda or transformation journey or digital transformation well, it is because um, we're all trying to move up the value chain and contribute to this uh, uh, transformation journey and the digital agenda. And GBS's biggest opportunity, in my view, to reposition and position away from being a transactional center is to participate in enterprise-wide digital activity. So whether it is to run a simple robotics center of ex, uh, excellence or center of expertise, or it is to provide larger, more advanced digital services. It's a really good way to change completely the perception of what a shared service organization or GBS is. And some companies have been so good at this that they have even rebranded their GBS into digital hub or similar wording. 
And that takes me to um, a client example that I had recently where a client said, well, you know, on this famous transformation journey, the issue is that basically transformation means metamorphosis. That's the old Greek word that, of course, you all knew because you all know old Greek. And the issue really is that we get on this journey and then somewhere in the middle of this picture, we're not really caterpillar anymore, nor are we butterfly. And we just keep hanging there and can't really fulfill any of the purpose that we're supposed to fulfill. So that's the worst place to be, you know, if you get stuck in the middle of this transformation journey. But what is even worse is the perception of what people think transformation is, because often people look at it like this, you know, on the top, you see the caterpillar is supposed to become a butterfly. That's what transformation is. But what people do when they re-engineer their processes, they just make this caterpillar a really fast caterpillar. And that, of course, is not actually the intention of what we're doing here, right? So making your process fast is not transformation. And that's why we showed you the um, caterpillar and the butterfly in the beginning of this slide sort of as a nice funny logo. So if you want to know more, I'll just show this because it's SSO and data. Contact SSO and data, ask me, ask Dan, and then we'll link you up with them. Otherwise, uh, the only thing that remains for me to say is thank you very much for listening, and then I will hand over to Dan for closing comments. Thank you very much, Tom. I love that story about the the caterpillar i can't get enough of it so thank you and some great data points they're really thought provoking so we've got a few minutes left um i mean those statistics you've given us some really interesting data points some which are slightly confusing some which make you think and it kind of reminds me of this whole iceberg thing you've got some data points at the top but you know what's hidden beneath and i i kind of relate this a little bit to the fact that a lot of these topics when you first ask the question it seems so obvious and then you dig into it it gets more complicated and it's kind of this dunning kruger idea that you know, smart people are insanely confident about things they don't really fully understand. And then when you actually have to have the misfortune to get into executing whatever that uh, particular topic is, you realize how painful it is in that trough of disillusionment in the middle. But if you do become an expert, um, you do become more confident, but never as confident as you were as a naive optimist. And I'm coming to the conclusion that we're probably all best off in the in the bottom or third, well, the kind of the third quarter, third or fourth quartile of that curve. But as Tom said, you look at all those data points and you think, well, we're doing this for 30 years, but why is it so slow getting to where we need to be? And we all, you know, we've we've had this kind of digital drive for some time now. We've, you know, digital is going to speed us up, but we also know that I think this is a McKinsey data point, 70% uh, of digital transformations don't deliver the value projected at kickoff. I think actually it's higher than that, and it's not because they're abject failures, but they don't deliver the absolute value in put together in optimistic business cases, and certainly not in the time frame. So yeah, that's a challenge. And why is that? Part of that is a little bit about the caterpillar, because you know, the first rule of technology is you apply automation to efficient operation, it magnifies the efficiency. But how many of us have efficient operations to start with? And that is the second part. So that's a pretty critical point for us. So but there is also this natural human resistance to change. It's a product of evolution. You know, it's the way it is. So we know that's one of the challenges. But you know, smart organizations are really developing good uh, tactics for change management, like really getting into the what's in it for me, the with them, for all the stakeholders and participants, making sure that change addresses the individual experience, not just the corporate outcome. And it's this kind of dichotomy, really, that change is happening very slow and sometimes it happens very sudden and that's kind of that's kind of weird but it, you see it in lots of organizations and i think that's kind of related to this aggregation of marginal gains idea which is you know if you listen to top athletes they swear by it you've got to keep doing little things to improve and that's how you get massive change and i think sometimes you turn around after a year or two and you do see things have changed dramatically but individual changes are incremental but part of this challenge i think for GBS and for shared services organizations is when trying to make this transformation, trying to make processes better, more effective, more customer focused, more value creating and more efficient is what does good look like? It's the hardest question in any business. It seems like it should be the easiest one, but it's the hardest question. It's bound up in lots of emotion, performance measures, lots of other things. And also the fact that different organizations, different silos in the business, have different views of what their business unit or their function 
sees as what good looks like because it relates to KPIs and performance measures. So it's a really difficult thing, and I think we're still getting the terms of that. But Tom touched on this about you know, this in this concept of end-to-end -end processes and global process ownership. If we're gonna if we're gonna solve this problem, we've got to get into silo busting. We've got to find ways of breaking down these, you know, the kind of trying to optimize efficiency in individual chunks. It's just not to, it's not working for us. And effective digital transformation is going to do that. So this isn't just a brain game, it's about getting things done. It's about the art of execution. And that is about IQ plus EQ. And again, Tom talked about empathy, maybe something you need to buy in, but uh, hopefully we can start developing people as well. And I think there's a great way of describing this challenge, which isn't from GBS, it's from surgeons. So this is uh, a, a Nobel Prize winner. And he, he says the same thing that we all know. We hope for the silver bullet. We hope for the easy fix, the one simple change or erase a problem, but it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen that way. It's about hundred small steps, one after the other. And that may be one of the reasons why we're struggling with the pace of change, because we still kind of hanker after this idea that it'll be a big, you know, some one big quick win, one piece of technology, one bit of AI or something is gonna change the world for us. So we've got to seize the opportunity that Thomas put before us. Um, and I think that's pretty key. We've got to please pop further questions in. We, I know we don't have much time. In fact, I'm not probably, I'm just gonna come down to this. This is what we've covered. Um, we're gonna take your questions. We've got a bunch of questions here. We're gonna to respond to you by email. But I would just like, before we close, a very important thing. So if you haven't got it in by on the GoToWebinar, pop me an email. But here, um, if you want to know more about the SSON research and analytics uh, world that Tom has been talking through, you can scan that QR code there on the left. And um, if you don't have your phone to hand, just email me and I'll, I'll get you introduced. Um, while you're looking at that, final thing, last 40 seconds is I said Tom is uh, a creative genius as well as a, a GBS shared services genius. And he's uh, he's this uh, he's with this digital natives uh, collection. And I'd like to give you 40 seconds, which you don't get in a webcast very often, where we're going to just give you a sense of what the digital natives is all about. And at the end of this, at the end of this 40 seconds, we're going to finish. But you can email me or anything else. Um, so let's see how we get on. Thank you. Give me some purpose, oh, what's it for?